right. Thank you, David. You can go ahead. Um, okay. Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my studies are much more informal than Danica's, more the nature of a retired professor, perhaps. <laughs> Danica is obviously still very active. Um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I like to spend as much time as I can, as close to home as I can, and one of the areas I've spent a lot of time exploring are, are the backlands. And in uh, 2013, I did a detailed study, volunteered to do a detailed study of the plant communities and involved Nick Hill, specifically because he's really the Nova Scotia expert in wetlands and as well as a close friend and colleague of mine. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is his uh, comes from his work. It's described in detail in, in our, our report. And also <clears throat> another person has been quite involved in looking at wetlands back there is Patricia Manuel, who I'll talk about. So I'm going to just spend most of my time describing some often overlooked components of the wetlands and watercourses and just a little bit about climatic uh, factors. So uh, to begin with, where are the backlands? Well, probably many people looking at uh, this webinar are familiar. They're uh, just off Peninsular Halifax and comprise the area enclosed by Purcell's Cove and Herring Cove Road and by Williams Lake at the north, uh, northwest and Powers Pond at the southeast. And it's a large, essentially undeveloped uh, wilderness area with nine lakes, lots of trails and so on and so forth. And there's uh, people now are very actively trying to conserve as much as that is possible. And one of the things we identified in our 2013 study is it hosts a globally rare uh, fire dependent plant community, the Jack Pine Broom Crowberry Barrens. Uh, approximately, these numbers are not accurate at all, but approximately now 60% of the land is either crown or is formally protected. Uh, so some big sections, all the colored stuff, including Clayton Developments, now the Shaw Park, is protected. But you can see there's still a lot of fragmentation with the private land that remains. Um, it includes two major watersheds, the McIntosh Run watershed, a large component of which is outside of the backlands and begins up around uh, Bears Lake in that area. So it includes quite a lot of dirty water. And then there's the Williams Lake watershed, which is about three quarters in the backlands, but also includes an urban component. And then there's some smaller watersheds over, over here and down by Herring Cove. And, and I like to think about the wetlands in the context of water of, of uh, watersheds and watercourses rather than as isolated wetlands. Uh, geologically, if you look at this, at the surficial geology, most of it's described as bedrock. Uh, which is either bedrock or, or very shallow soils over most of the area. It includes a, a very significant, if you look at the uh, subsurface geology, it includes a very significant contact zone between the granites, which are about 350 million years uh, old, and then the, the Maguma rocks up here, are just south of southeast of Williams Lake. There's a big con a significant contact zone. I'll talk quite a bit about that zone. And then if we look at the vegetation, all of this sort of this stuff here is all the, um, what I described, blueberries or barren, so not much forest. So a lot of it's covered with forest. It tends to be quite young forest because the area is burned quite regularly. It includes hardwoods and softwoods. Now we look at the wetlands. This is what's officially mapped. And it adds up to 87.2 hectares, or approximately 6.5% of the backlands, which is close to the average for the province, which is using the same criteria as roughly 6.6, as I understand it, in, in freshwater, uh, freshwater wetlands. So that's kind of what we accept as the wetlands of the backlands. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about is what's not included in this slide. What, a very significant figure here, there's very few bogs. And uh, oh yeah, there's also very few surface waters in this larger area. Here, here's where you see surface, you know, open streams. But this whole area, you see very few perennial streams. You may see seasonal streams. And um, bogs, um, well, three quarters of the wetlands in uh, terrestrial Nova Scotia are 
are bogs in Nova Scotia. It, they're only about less than 5% in the backlands. And a really good, nice example is this bog in the top of Piggy Mountain. And, you know, bogs are really the only self-contained kind of wetland. All other kinds of wetlands are in water courses. And that's a feature that we tend to, to overlook in a lot of our wetland conservation and concerns and so on. So here's kind of a diagram of the, an overview of the water flow in the wetlands. And a lot of the water that hits the wetlands falls on the rocklands, on the, in the ridges, the barrens and the whalebacks. And it doesn't hold it, it just flows off right away. And this pathway is the, the pathway that Nick and I mapped for the movement of that water. And it can then go into what we call boulder fields or mountain holy wash, mountain holy, not mountain holy, sorry, mountain holy washes. Then go to vernal pools, then do it into fence and swamps. And some of those fence and swamps can feed back into those same kinds of systems. And then eventually it, it gets to the lake. Now, another similar system, similar components to that are what, what, what I call the fields of whalebacks. And I'll talk a bit about those. They've got similar characteristics but they're a little bit different. And the, the significance of these small wetlands, particularly, and I should say the ones with the asterisks are generally not recognized or protected. And um, the significance of the wetlands in this system are that they slow, besides being important for biodiversity, in terms of water movement and so on, they slow, cool, and filter the water. Okay, so here I've just added a few diagrams to show you what these systems are like. So we're showing the, the, the ridges up here. These boulder fields, which are large pieces of angular rock that were dropped by the glaciers. When I first saw them, I thought they must have been old quarries, but they're not. And you see that over quite a bit of the Shibukto Peninsula and possibly other areas of Nova Scotia. Uh, these are examples of the mountain holly washes, and these are really wonderful areas with this magnificent plant mountain holly. And once you recognize it, you see a lot of them on the Shibato Peninsula. And then here's a vernal pond up here. So this pond will be completely dry in summer, except maybe this summer, fills up every now and then. And it's not generally recognized, although it will qualify as a wetland formally, uh, it's often just completely overlooked in wetland delineation and so on. And then down here we have um, these boulder fields. This is up around Governor's Brook. These are really amazing. I think these are these are almost globally rare. The way we have them in the backlands is it's close to a globally rare uh, landscape, I believe. You really need to look into that. And then as we get lower down, we have significant floodplains, these large wetlands and so on, and then we, we get into the lake. So I'll, um, I'll go over each of these a little bit. Now here's uh, a diagram of, that Nick put together, how he, he traced the movement of the water through these different components in the watershed. And I should say that the, these um, these landscapes are really, I think I've got it to the next one, oh, possibly not. Yeah, another significant aspect here in the, in the Williams Lake backlands is that a lot of the larger wetlands lie along this contact zone. And you can see how you've got these outcrops and ridges on both sides here. And then this is this contact zone between the granitic rocks up here and the older Maguma rocks here. And, and this whole area is a contact zone and there's large wetlands all along here. And that water tends to flow along here. So a lot of these other components are, are here that feed into these large wetlands. So this is a very significant component of this whole thing. And a point to emphasize is that the backlands are very much a mosaic of, of habitats. You, know, can, you can tell that just looking at Google Earth. So you can have a wetland right next to a dry land. You can have forested area right next to almost a desert area and so on and so forth. It's just an important component to recognize when we're, um, you know, looking at these issues. So to go through, to give you some uh, visual examples of some of the components of the systems, the ridges, and if you've been in the backlands, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about the oak crops. Here are the whalebacks down here. So this, this is where, you know, the water that falls here, it just flows down very, very quickly. Where, where there's trees and so on, you've got a lot of interception and that will slow it down. But a lot of the water that comes in 
flows in here very quickly and then goes into the, you know, into the um, boulder fields and the washes and so on. So here's an example of the boulder fields. They're quite, quite spectacular when you see them. They rarely have standing water, but you can usually hear water below them. They do not qualify as wetlands or even water courses, but they're, they're definitely water courses. Uh, there's very little living in them, possibly because of um, toxic materials in the rocks themselves. And then here are some pictures of the mountain holly washes. I don't know if Sheila Stevenson is here, but I included one behind her house. And, um, you know, you have these lovely gnarled mountain holly plants that form these washes. And um, I'll leave you to read a bit about this and they posted slides. I won't spend a lot of time going over it, but these are, these are legally wetlands if, if you, well, except for one problem, that the mountain holly in Nova Scotia is classified as, as a facultative wetland species. In the US, it's, it's classified as an obligate wetland species. So the vegetation doesn't meet some of the criteria to qualify for wetland in the Nova Scotia system. But the soils themselves generally do meet those criteria. It just gives you an example of, of the problem of protecting these areas uh, when, they're, when they're a little different. And these washes I've discovered since that study can, ex can, ex can occur on, a, on, a, on some very extreme slopes. And they're, they're really quite spectacular. Uh, some examples of the vertical pools. This is in the springtime when they're full. And, you know, these, you get in the landscape, you get kind of little, you get, um, you get these kind of, uh, let me see what Nick, how he describes it. It occurs wherever there are, are depressions in the landscape and are impermeable soil or rock layers, size less from five square meters to hundreds of square meters. And, and they're kind of like where you get areas where the water levels out and it doesn't go into the ground, you get these areas and then they'll dry out. And in the summertime, they just look like an open leafy area. Uh, and, and generally the water movement between them is mostly underground. And often you'll find a little spring above them as shown at the bottom left going into it. And a lot of the water movement in this landscape is seasonal and a lot of it is, is below ground. So we tend not to recognize it. Uh, this is a map by, by a student of Patricia Manuel based on, um, on LIDAR and other types of imagery uh, showing all potential vernal pools. So you can see there's a heck of a lot of them in this landscape. So very significant, but not recognized wetland. Uh, and also part of these water courses. Now the whalebacks and troughs, I said to me, these are very special, almost unique systems. If you've been on the bike barrens back by governor's book, you, you've been through them. And um, so you have the whalebacks, which look like whalebacks, and then you have the, the depressions, or I call them troughs because they're like waves and troughs. And those troughs are areas of water movement. And where they're wetter, you get typical wetland vegetation as shown at the right. And these are quite small systems. So again, they're not, you know, they're not recognized as wetlands or even watercourses, but they are both. And very important features of the uh, backlands. And then some examples of the larger wetlands we can't really overlook because they're, they're large, they're prominent, they're beautiful. And uh, the, depending on the season, they're, they're very, very, you know, they're full of water. So the classical type of wetlands, which generally are protected. Uh, okay, I'll talk a little bit about some of these climate influences. Uh, fire and wetlands in the backlands. I mean, basically, and on the map at the top left shows you the two, roughly the limits of the 2009 Spryfield fire. And the X's are areas where I've looked at quite familiar with that's are, are larger wetlands with what to stop the fire you can actually see the boundary between them so the the fire stopped at those and, it, and the fire moved more or less uh westward or from southwest to sorry eastward from southwest to northeast it moved across the landscape from left to right and these larger wetlands stopped the fire it was a factor in the fires stopping in those areas. And I've shown some of the interfaces here on the right. Some of these wetlands are not recognized. For example, this bottom one here, this is this, this is in this area up here. 
And it's not recognized at all as a wetland. It's, it's a forested wetland. And here's some tamarack in it. it may, you know, it may not formally qualify as a wetland. I, I really don't know. It's not recognized on the maps. Uh, you'd have to go out and do it. But it certainly acted like a wetland, and it certainly stopped that fire moving up here. It's very clear even, even today. Hey, David. Just to let yes. you know that you're at 15 minutes. Okay. Um, now, the, the smaller wetlands are, are essentially burnt. And I should say the whole backlands is an area, it's one of the most fire-prone areas in Nova Scotia, and the vegetation except around the permanent streams is highly adapted to fire. So the smaller wetlands burn over, everything gets burned, but they recover within two to three years. That's been my observation on them. So all of these smaller wetlands burn, but This summer, but this summer they were really full, and the water is still flowing out of those wetlands. So it's still holding the water back from. Um, it's still holding those heavy rains. So these are these big wet, the big wetlands is where the, that water is stored. Um, I've done a little bit of studying of invasive plants in the wetlands, and uh, this summer I looked. I was a bit concerned about finding a lot of Rosa. Multiflora up here on the top of, of Lawson's Brook. So I did a survey of the wetland plants and found quite a bit of uh, multiflora rose and Japanese knotweed and also border privet hanging over the wetland. So these would be interfering with the wetland. The multiflora rose de definitely competes with Canada holly. I'm not sure what Japanese knotweed competes with. It tends to spread over the stream. Border pivot probably competes with Canada holly. Another one I found, which is not really aquatic, but on the borders was Japanese barberry, not even recognized as an invasive species. But interesting, if you go on the single track trail, now that's an area that has quite a history of industrial use. There's a lot of activity around and so on. But the trail going from here, right all along through these wetlands, right up of these wetlands, I surveyed this hole very, very carefully. And it's a fairly well walked area, and there's not one single exotic or invasive species. So it's evidence that that's really an ecologically intact um, system, which is very encouraging. Uh, I've also done um, I've done studies on on the uh, limnology of Williams Lake and a little bit on Colpit Lake, and um, uh, uh, Charles Bull had volunteered to do some. Um, electrical conductivity monitoring Governor's Brook up here, and so we have we have a little bit of idea of how the, how the waterways that are that have urban influence are affected by salt loading, and also that would mean other pollutants. And this just gives you some approximate average values. So these are values, background values off of undeveloped land, very very low electrical conductivity values. That that's basically pure water in terms of natural systems. Here we have very heavy loading from up around Bayers Lake. It goes into Culpit Lake, gets diluted as it comes down here because there's water going in here into Williams Lake. Again, very low conductivity water coming in here. So this would be high conductivity water going here. And these levels, if they get much higher, they're getting into the area where they, they're potentially uh, toxic, uh, uh, long-term chronic toxicity to aquatic life. And the main factor affecting the salt levels in these types of systems is the percent developed on the landscape. Now, right now, it, that's not moving. You know, Williams Lake watershed is fairly stable. The Culpit Lake watershed is probably fairly stable. It probably won't increase a lot more. But where we do increase them, we get increased salt loading, and that's becoming a bigger issue. I just mentioned that. So I'll close with what's protected, and that's kind of a lot of the point of the of the presentation that most of what I've been talking about is not protected. We don't protect small wetlands. We know that. Here's, a, to me, a terrible example of one that was taken out of, up in the top of Ocean View Drive, a beautiful little wetland, uh, less, right, right on the border of 100 square meters. And it was simply taken out and a road put in. Uh, but these other types, they're often not protected because they're either not recognized as wetlands or they're, or they're too or they're too small, and yet they are. They account, you know. I I think these un these 
unrecognized wetlands would probably triple the amount of wetland and watercourse in the backlands compared to what we kind of formally recognize. And uh, Nick Hill describes this area as having features of dry land systems in which as much as 80% of the water flow is, is below ground and through these types of unprotected systems. So those are some of the special qualities of, of the backlands and that are important both for, you know, it's one of the reasons that we make the argument that, that we really don't want to develop the backlands because you simply can't substitute for these types of systems. They're almost very unique types of systems. Um, anyway, I think that's it. Let's... Um, and like I said earlier, you can put your questions in the chat or you can also raise your hand if you prefer like speaking directly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of have a question about the vernal pools which is kind of like something I've been interested in. Um, why aren't why aren't they like considered wetlands or like why aren't they, you know, like when when people are doing up maps, they don't often include them. Well, because um, part of it would depend on when they map. And if you're not mapping in the period when there's high water, they're easily overlooked. And a lot of the wetland delineation, you know, Nick would be is the guy to talk about this. But, but wetland delineation tends to be about, you know, defining a, a big wetland and putting boundaries on it. And so people just tend not to look at water courses on these more subtle things. Uh, and they just, they, they tend to get lost in that, in that mix. And of course, the smaller ones, a lot of them are smaller than 100 square meters. So even if they recognize them as wetlands, uh, they're, they're not, you know, there's no obligation to protect them. And probably majority of the ones in the backlands are less than 100 square meters, but collectively they're they're extremely important. Yeah, I agree that they're important. I mean, I have I have one close to my house that is often fluctuating, but I see like all sorts of different critters in there. Yeah. Um, I'm also uh, curious if either you or Danica have been to any of the like fire sites. Um, I was recently out in Shelburne and drove past um, this sort of like bog that had completely been burnt. And I'm just interested about like the regeneration of that and if either of you know anything about it or. Well, I, I followed the, um, I followed the, after the Spryfield fire, I was out there within four days. In fact, a DNR helicopter came in and told me to get out because the ground was still smoldering. So I followed that for 16 months. Um, and I actually have a set of slides on that on the Halifax Field Naturalist website. And, um, you know, those, those, those the, the backland systems recovered quickly because they're all essentially fire adapted. And I think a lot of what burnt in Nova Scotia will recover fairly quickly. Um, the stuff, but but that fire burned burned deeper than a lot of the spring fires, and a lot of may not may not recover that quickly. I think a person to talk to about that would be Donna Crossland because she followed that that bad, quite bad fire. I think it was when two thousand seventeen or eighteen. Uh, there was a bad fire in the late summer that burned fairly deeply, but I think even that system's coming back. So, so they do tend to come back. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say about it. I, have, I haven't, I haven't actually looked at some of these recent burns. I'd like to do that, but it's surprising how quickly they come back. It is, yeah. It's it's like all blueberries returning. So next year they'll be yeah, very good for blueberries. It's, Second year, second year after the fire, very good. Yeah. Yeah, but the small wetlands specifically. So yeah, any any steps that can be taken to protect them. You know, my 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 honestly, my kind of perspective on this at this point, you know, you take these recent floods and what they did, we now know why we need these systems. You know, and, and our our wetland protection, our watercourse protection that we have to date 
it has not been adequately protecting those systems when we get these types of floods. So again, you know, this is my own perspective. So that really what we need to do and that we're recognizing more and more what we need to do is we need to concentrate our development in areas that are already developed, you know, densifying. And in my mind, we, we should never develop in an ecologically intact area when, when there's an already degraded area available. Now that's a hard pill for a lot of developers to swallow. But but I know areas, there's one area 12 out by Sandy Lake right now, that's up for development. And it's covered with trees, it's got significant wetlands. They had horrendous floods there, you know, with that recent floods back there. And if they do the normal type of development there and also west of Sandy Lake, it's gonna be a lot worse in future. So to me, you know, you, you just can't, like in the back, you cannot protect how, how are you going to protect those so many of those small wetlands without protecting the much larger area? So I, I to me, you know, I, I appreciate your your thing about how to protect these small wetlands, but it, it's kind of a collective thing, uh, and that we really, I don't know how Dan, uh, Danica feels about that, but but these recent floods, man, they really showed us that these are these things are really. And one thing, I I went up in the Williams Lake backlands after those floods because I wanted to see in the intact system if it made a mess of the forest. It did not. It absolutely made no mess of, mess of it at all. Um, you know, a bit of mud thrown around and stuff, but no damage there at, at all in the, in the intact system. So, so that's kind of, I think, to me, those are the kind of levels we, we need to start to think about those things. And I think David, you you raise an excellent point, and I really I, I really loved your in your presentation how you looked at the impact and the importance of these wetlands on tidal flow and flood rate regulation, because I think that's something that we're missing right now within our both land use planning and emergency management is we have sort of the environmental specter looking for protection for a habitat ecosystem perspective and yeah. that we have EMO simply looking at perhaps topography, low-lying areas and water courses, but there has been no work to integrate the two and looking at the, the benefit. And this perhaps is an opportunity of using these, you know, devastating floods as an example yeah. um, where we can merge um, those intact ecosystems with flood protection and start having those cross dialogues so that when we're preventing an area from development, it's not just the ecological lens, but it's the public safety lens as well. Yeah. So I think there's we have an opportunity here to do so. So I think, yeah, it just could be yeah. strategic time to yeah. really push as HRM and other areas are starting to develop more of their flood mitigation strategies and yeah. mapping, well, let's put the two layers together and see where we can actually protect and create these flood resistant or flood resilient, I would say, um, yeah. systems. That's my two thoughts about that. Yeah, David, we have just a few seconds. Uh, Go ahead. I, I just thought of um, something I didn't think of as aware of, but I didn't think of in terms of these smaller wetlands, there is a provision in the wetland legislation that that you can collect, you, you can protect a collection of smaller wetlands if they're connected. So I guess part of the answer to that, you want to protect some of those things, you need to look at these water courses and map those out and show that they're they're you, you know that they're they're connected. And then yes, even within the existing system, uh, they could, in principle, be protected. So, so that's something to be aware of, I think, where people are concerned about that in specific instances. If they can actually map those out and show how they're connected, they would have a basis to protect them when they might otherwise not. I wonder if the Nova Scotia Nature Trust or any other conservation groups are making the effort to purchase the land in the backlands for conservation. Do you know, David? Oh yes, there's quite a, you know, there's a very active backlands coalition and uh, definitely there's, and, and Nature Trust has protected new, pro two, I think two new properties within the last two years there. 
and and I'm aware that there's other stuff going on. So there's de that's definitely definitely occurring. I, I'm fairly op I'm fairly optimistic about most of it ultimately being protected. Awesome, thank you, David. And this one's a little bit similar, but Heather is wondering about crown land around East and West Pine Island Pond. There are many wetland vernal ponds and diverse species of plants, uh, and they're concerned about what could potentially be permitted on crown land regarding development. I think, David, that's another question for you. Well, that I mean, that part is a little bit different from a lot of the rest of the backlands. It's a wetter area. Uh, I just, you know, I just hope they don't develop down there. What can you say? What can you say? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know what else to say. Agreed. Agreed. Those are beautiful. Those those that they're they're really beautiful systems down there, and they support a lot of aquatic birds and so on. Um, yeah, so I, I hope they won't be developed, but but I can't tell you more. <laughs> 